we can get rolling. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is David Koken. Um, I am a former uh, software developer. Um, started off my career in, in open source and um, found out that I was much better at um, watching what everybody else was doing and more curious about what they were doing than being a developer myself. So um, made a transition to law uh, and I've been practicing in the area of technology law for about um, a dozen years now. Um, and I'm currently with Nixon Peabody. Um, so, uh, so today we're gonna talk about um, AI in the law and particularly some of the challenges that um, AI is facing right now in the areas that I predominantly work in, which is IP. So patents, copyrights, trademarks, you name it. Um, just to get a sense, how many people here are developers who are, are putting their fingers on code on a daily basis? Okay, and how, how many people are in management? Okay, all right. Um, so about half, half, and then any, anybody, any lawyers in the house? All right. <laughs> um, all right, so we got a good mix. So um, if this is too dumbed down, I, so working with engineers and people in tech, I find to be one of the most challenging because they tend to be the smartest, they ask the best questions, especially when it comes to law. Um, uh, so if, if I've dumbed this down too low, um, I apologize and feel free to follow up afterwards if you wanna uh, get into some more uh, 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 crazy discussions. So when you think about uh, AI, or when you talk with your friends and colleagues, at least when I do, this is probably what people think of right away, right? Open AI, Bard, Meta, Chat, um, and that's a big part of it, right? But it's it's really, there's a whole universe out there, as I'm kind of speaking to the choir here, um, that involves so many different open source projects um, that I can't really even fit them all on one screen. Like I stopped, I think at about 30 or so, uh, and I just said, okay, that's, that's enough. Um, and there's a really big difference between these, these models that everybody knows about they're really in the public domain or in the public consciousness and then everything else that, that we're developing on it and uh, is serving a really valuable purpose but being licensed under an open source model. So these open, like open chat GPT type models are not truly open. And again, this is probably stuff that a lot of you already know, but um, they're not being licensed underneath an open source license, right? They're, they're more freeware. They have use restrictions. Um, they're free to use, but under certain conditions. Um, and that's really important because uh, what you get tied into today could change down the road, uh, especially if you're, you're tied into the AP, API. Also, it's, you know, open source is a very much a community. Um, it's about promoting open source development. Um, and that's its own culture. It has its own, um, Political, uh, not political, political is not the right word, but like um, uh, its own separate motivation that's separate from proprietary developed code. Um, and that's important to, to know. So the first area we're gonna talk about is copyright, the state of copyright law as it relates to AI. So the Copyright Office, as many of you may have heard, is going through a notice and comment period right now. They're asking the public, um, lawyers, engineers, managers, what they think about the current state of copyright law. You can log in um, to their website and provide your comments. Some of you may have already done that. Um, but a lot of what they're really focusing on isn't gonna be terribly groundbreaking, right? Um, the focus of, of the messaging that's come out so far has been, you know, copyright applies only to human creations. And if it's generated by a machine, can't get a copyright on it. Um, okay, that's easy. Um, when said, but what does that actually mean? Because it's rarely the case where you're, you're handing something off to a machine and generating out. It's, it's a collaborative process with, with the AI where it's iterative, um, with the algorithms, with the software. Um, and w what about AI generated source code, right? So we're getting into this area where, um, I hate to go back to the chat GPT, but that's a good example everybody recognizes. 
where you can ask it to generate a certain amount of, of code in you know, Java, whatever, and spit it out. Um, is that protectable as a copyright? Um, probably not um, if it's being generated by a machine. Because again, the Copyright Office is going to be looking for the, the human who's, who's doing it. Because that's just a fundamental aspect of copyright law is that it has to be a human who's, who's steering the wheel. But if, if you're um, playing with it, if you're tinkering with it, if it gives you an output and you're like, I don't really like that, adjust this, adjust that, and you're pulling a bunch of levers to get the desired code that you want, then it's looking more like a human is behind the steering wheel calling the shots. And, and has that, that level of creativity is what they call, what they're looking for. And then the copyrights start to trigger. Um, and what about the output uh, as a derivative work on the training data? So a lot of people have asked about that. I think that that's probably, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger stretch to try to say that the, um, the, the end results uh, like if you, images, for example, uh, if there's any similarity to the underlying data itself, um, if, if it's just purely the result of you asking the AI to generate something and it spits it out um, without you really having a whole lot of input into what it looks like, then again, you're going back to the human versus machine. But if you're more involved in the process of the iteration of it, then you could invoke copyrights a little bit more. The problem with, with training data, though, is if you're the one who's um, uh, pulling the levers, the user, you don't really know what the underlying training data is, right? So there's almost, there's a separation between the two. And it starts to look a lot more like Google Books and search crawlers than it does that, like I'm sitting down and I'm, I'm making copies from a book itself. Um, it's unclear how the courts are going to come out on this, but there is some, some case law in this area that, that might be instructive. Now, one of the interesting things about the Google cases is, so in, in the law, um, we like to pretend that we've got these hard black letter rules and it's very logical and we like to stay consistent with it. But in reality, you know, people's biases, their um, personal preferences, uh, who they, they got to go to school with in law school. All that stuff matters. Uh, and it's possible that the reason why there's a lot of fair use results in the Google Books set of cases was because these judges, uh, they could understand the technology. They're not the most savvy. And they may have been using the tech themselves. They may have been using Google Books to do research so they're familiar with it. They, they can understand it. They can understand why the fair use rules would apply to that sort of thing. Would the same results happen with AI? Especially when you're getting into training data and models, which, I mean, at the end of the day, they're, it's, it's not that difficult to understand, but if you're not in this sphere, if you're not speaking this language on a day-to-day -day basis, the barrier to entry to understand it is, is much harder, much higher, than it is for, like, say, a Google Books that anybody can pick up and understand right away. Um, so I, I like to put this so uh, one of the, my early things that I like to tinker with in ChatGPT, I've got three kids. Uh, bedtime is always a challenge. Um, and I get sick of reading. You can only read if you give a mouse a cookie so many times. So um, I started asking ChatGPT to develop st short stories for my kids, right? It, where they're the superheroes. And my wife and I are, are like the parents in the superhero team. Um, so the left is myself, I'm Dynamo, and then my wife, and then my two sons, and then they made their youngest sister the evil, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we had to add some narrative where she comes to the, the light side at the end and, and have a discussion about that. But I actually think hers is the coolest, personally. Um, but I didn't realize this until my son pointed out, but it kind of, the, 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 AI, the AI, I think it, it was with Dolly that um, generated this. Uh, my son pointed out that it looks a lot like Blue Beetle. Um, and that's not, I didn't pick up on that at all. I didn't even know who Blue Beetle was. Uh, how many people actually know who Blue Beetle is? All right, I, 
I feel kind of embarrassed. Um, now, I didn't ask that. I just put in, I said, these are the traits of my character that, that ChatGPT generated separately. And then I went and I started a new chat. And I said, based on these characteristics, just generate me a, um, a, an image of what my character might look like. And that's what it came up with. Now, is it, is it, um, is it, did it come up with this because during the training process, it sampled a lot of Blue Beetle and a lot of other similar superheroes, and they tend to look like this, and so therefore uh, it's more likely that I'm gonna get this? Um, I don't know. One thing that I can do to check um, would be to ask the, the, the AI, you know, what, what were your inspirations for this, right? And if it comes back, well, there's two things. One, if it comes back and it says um, Blue Beetle, that's, that's a concern. I might want to tweak it a little bit just to protect myself. Um, but then on top of that, if I'm looking at that and I say, gee, that looks awful a lot like Blue Beetle, um, and I'm using it for commercial purposes, let's say, uh, I might be hesitant to use it not necessarily because I genuinely think that there's a copyright violation there. Like if you dig underneath the, the, the hood of the car and you figure out how it was created, maybe it's purely safe. But if you look at it and you get a savvy plaintiff's attorney out there, they might see, well, that a judge is gonna see that. It's gonna say, wow, they look very similar. And getting to the point where we actually understand how it was actually generated, that's gonna be way down the road after I file a, 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 a lawsuit, right? You're gonna have to go through all this dis expensive discovery. The odds of, of the other side wanting to go through that are pretty slim. Maybe they'll just settle, right? Um, and I hate to say that, but that's, that's the way a lot of the calculus works um, from, from lawyers' perspectives. So um, just to avoid it, you know, it's, it's good to, to go through the smell test, right? Does it, does it, does it look like anything else? Am I going to invite um, an attack by putting it out there or relying on it in a commercial way? So other factors, um, right now the law is very unclear about AI. I mean, AI at the end of the day, it's really nothing new. It's statistical, statistical modeling um, that we've been doing for a very long time. It's just we have much more powerful computers. Um, but for whatever reason, copyright office, patent office, um, they're really struggling to understand it because they think it's something new. I think the media plays a big role in this because you know it, it is being characterized as something completely novel and new. In, in many ways it is. Like it is gonna be um, very, um, it's gonna change a lot of our lives in, in positive and in negative ways, but it's gonna make society very different. Um, but it's, the t underlying technology is not very, it, it's, it's not anything that's new. Um, but um, there are, they are looking at, does a law need to be changed, right? They're going through this notice and comment period which the Copyright Office can't really change the law per se, but they can um, maybe use that to, in, what they're trying to do is they're trying to understand the technology better to understand how to apply existing copyright laws and patent laws to the technology. That's the goal. It would take Congress to step in, which they might. Other countries right now are talking about enacting legislation related to AI. Um, so we might get something like that too. There's a lot of, um, companies that have a vested interest in making sure that parts of their, their AI systems can be protected. Um, and as I'll get into, um, there's some challenges under the existing legal frameworks for that. But as those get defined, you have to remember, these are gonna be defined by jurors and judges who oftentimes aren't very technically savvy. Um, some jurisdictions, they deal with a lot of patent cases. They're gonna be a little bit better. They're gonna understand it a little bit better. but you know, the jurors, these are gonna be your neighbors. Um, and imagine, you know, at Thanksgiving when you're, you're talking to a family member, you're trying to explain what you do. Um, you know, those are gonna be the people who are gonna be deciding some of these cases. Um, and that's gonna invite uh, their biases um, and their, their lack of understanding and how they apply the law to these situations. You know, if, a person is confronted with a case that involves copying of images, they might 
come out a little bit differently because it's something they can understand, they can appreciate, or music, copying, versus understanding the intricacies of training an algorithm or training a model, right? They're, just getting them to understand and pay attention is gonna be a challenge. So ensuring that they, they have a, um, the, a, a, an effective outcome uh, is, is gonna be even harder. Um, you know, one of the other things about this is going back to those examples, the, the chat GPTs, the BARDs, like a big part of, of their system is behind the scenes, right? They're, a lot of their, their algorithms, their models are closely guarded secrets. Um, they're, a lot of them are protected by trade secrets. Um, and they're all, they're cloud-based, right? Which is, in many ways, um, very different from open source where, you know, you can go on to uh, GitHub and for TensorFlow, you can, you can get all the source code, you can get example models, um, it's all downloadable. So what does this mean for the law? If, so one of the things that, that spurs changes in the law are lawsuits, right? Um, and to, to bring a lawsuit, you kind of have to know what the other side is doing. If what they're doing is on the cloud, it's hidden, that makes it really hard to do. Um, and on the other side, if I'm developing a technology and I wanna keep it hidden and secret, Am I going to want to sue somebody else if, if it's going to um, mean that it could uh, get disclosed publicly? I mean, probably not. So that means that on that side, there's, there's not going to be a lot of, there might be some law that's being developed, but really, I think in the open source community, there's a lot of opportunities to be a trailblazer uh, because it's all out there, right? Um, and so um, uh, there is that. That, that incentive and uh, the open source community has been traditionally very good about creating terms and licenses and dissecting the problems from a from a legal perspective to make sure that that um, the goals of open source are advanced and can be advanced through these terms and so there's that motivation to to to, to move it forward that doesn't exist to the same extent in in the private proprietary tech area all right so um, I used to teach, and I know that we're uh, right before lunch, so um, I, uh, I got some uh, sugar incentive. So true or false, copyrights can be used to protect open source AI works. Who, who wants to take a guess? This is straight from San Francisco, Ghirardelli. Yes. Uh, let's see. True. All right. Uh, I didn't, I didn't think that one through. <laughs> All right, that's right. So um, it might seem antithetical because open source is all about uh, sharing and copyright. You, you might think that is um, about restricting, but in many ways, uh, by getting your, cop your, your code um, registered, it allows uh, you to protect it from uh, keeping others from, from misappropriating it, right? Taking it and spinning it off, forking it, and doing something that's, that goes beyond the term of the license. And why is that? Um, if you register your copyright, you can seek statutory damages. Um, now, you automatically get a copyright whenever you create a work, but if you don't register it, you can't get statutory damages. You can't get infringement damages, and you can't get attorney's fees. That matters because um, very few attorneys are gonna to wanna to take on the case, right? Now, just because you have that ability doesn't mean that you're gonna use it. Uh, really why it matters is, if you see somebody using your code in a way that isn't consistent with open source principles, you wanna stop them. The first thing you do is you just send a letter, right? You have a lawyer write up a letter, it takes like 30 minutes, it pops, and on the, on the receiving end, if I look at that and I say, well, they don't have any copyrights, the most they can do is they can try to get a court injunction, which is the court saying, you gotta stop it. But they don't have any fight, they don't, there's no financial incentive for an attorney to help them. They've gotta have deep pockets to bring the suit. It's probably not as, um, as scary. Uh, disclosure of the code is not really an issue. Disclosure of code in general in copyrights is not 
really as big of a problem as people think. You don't have to disclose like everything. Um, uh, there's a lot of people who, who are concerned they want to take trade secret route because they fear about publicizing their code. Not, not as bad as, as, um, as it sounds. You don't have to post up as much as, as many people think. But with open source, you're already you know, sharing it anyway. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually advancing the, the cause. Um, and it also comes with additional safeguards, right? So somebody takes your code, they're, they're forking it, they're modifying it, and then they're trying to, to ship it, like in the United States. If you have a copyright registration, you can go to the, borders, the border protection or the ITC and try to stop it. Less of an issue with CDs, but like if you're using it in, say, um, chips or, or hardware and you're using open source in combination with that and it gets loaded on the hardware, then it becomes, has a lot more teeth in it. And it attracts funding because it's in many ways an insurance policy, right? If I'm a venture capitalist or an investor and you have IP and it's registered, if you ever go belly up, then you can, that, that, that IP is an asset, right? It has value. Um, and their biggest concern is recovering their investment if things go south, which is often the case with with VC or with um, with startups or mid-sized companies anyway. Um, so it's the traditional benefits are that it's really easy to deploy uh, an open source license. You just draft it up, um, maybe like a half day's work. It's just a text document. You put it in the software code, and there you go. You're you're good to go. Um, it's a high trust government uh, governance um, where uh, you can't unilaterally change license. You can change it going forward, but if you've already licensed something to somebody, like you're, you have that license, right? Um, and it creates clarity, uh, especially in OSS. There's years, decades of, of standard terms that have been carefully crafted by the community in collaboration with lawyers to make sure that it's, it's tailored to, to promote the goals of OSS, right? So you can, you can easily go to it. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's so many different OSS licenses to choose from now um, to fit your needs, and they're reliable. Uh, and uh, the applicability to international uh, law, the Berne Convention. All right, so I kind of talked about this already, but is registering your copyright pointless? <laughs> All right, you said it first. That's right. <laughs> Who doesn't? All right, so that's right, false. Um, it gives you the ability to bring an infringement suit. Uh, it gives public notice of ownership. So there's, there's so many different reasons why it's helpful. Um, why is public notice of ownership and legal evidence of ownership and presumption of validity important? Because it makes bringing the lawsuit cheaper, right? Again, going back to, you're not necessarily gonna file a lawsuit. Like nobody hopes that to be the outcome. But if you ever do have to file or send a cease and desist letter, it's good to have teeth behind it, right? You want the other side to know that if they don't adhere, that there could be actual consequences. Um, and that involves uh, potential damages. Yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll race through so I can get through questions. Um, copyright alone is enough to protect open up. Uh, I think we talked about that. So now going to open source in particular, it's an awkward fit, right? So on one end in copyright law, you've got your GUI, which if you think about it, there's a lot of creativity involved. It's not, it's not as functional, um, the, the stuff that you're developing. Um, you have a lot of flexibility and, and choice in how you do it. You've got your source code, which depending on what the code is actually doing, if it's purely functional, where there's, there's maybe one or two ways to do something, it's, it, the, the copyright protection is a little weaker. But if you've got some flexibility, you're putting in your style, um, in your choices, then uh, there's more protection there. Database schemas are a little funky in copyright law. The closest an analogy is to like a phone book. Um, there's a 
the classical case that we all learn in, in law school where the white pages are not copyrightable, but the yellow pages could potentially be, right? So if you think about a database, uh, the schema, if it's a very um, uh, practical, functional schema where there's really only one way you're going to do it or one way everybody does it, less protection. But if it looks more like a yellow pages um, where you're exercising a lot of creativity in how you're, you're, you're structuring the relationships between the databases, uh, different tables, um, and the variable names and things like that, uh, then you, I've seen stronger protection in, in suits that have actually pursued um, infringement. Um, one of the big ones that comes to mind is uh, Oracle, um, who also dabbles in open source, um, who has a lot of uh, copyrights in Oracle database. Um, and, and uh, MySQL. Uh, and then when you start getting into the functional code, the data and the algorithms, it gets weaker and weaker. Because again, you're moving away from cre human creativity. You're talking about things that th the courts are considering fundamental laws of nature, right? They don't want you claiming a right into a mathematical formula um, that uh, is uh, like, Pythagorean theorem, right? Um, that's an extreme, but that's how they're looking at these things when they hear the word algorithm. Uh, even though there might be a lot of creativity in it, and source code is kind of algorithmic anyways, um, they, they don't see it at that level, right? Um, and again, the dichotomy between human versus machine generated code is important. Um, one thing that's really important is copyright protects the, the code in the works themselves, right? So if I've got a, a book, um, it'll protect the words in the book, my story, but um, it won't protect the idea of a book, right? If I invented a book, like that wouldn't be protected, but, but the stories inside of it, that could be protected. Um, for that, you, you're looking more towards patent law, which there are some, some protections that exist in, in uh, for open for open source AI, potentially. Um, I mentioned many of the OSS concepts that are tried and true don't have close analogs in AI. Um, enforcement's a little bit harder for a lot of the provisions that try to attach traditional licenses to things that aren't really copyrightable. So like if you try to, to, to create a, a license that's, that's more geared towards copyright for like a data set, or a model, the, the model that's generated after the iteration process of the training process that's machine generated, then the courts are gonna say, well, this isn't really an, a copyright license. It's more like a contract term. And why does that matter? Because then you lose those, those, those cool things you get when you register your copyright, the, the statutory damages, the, the, the um, attorney's fees, the things that make, that give teeth to to your enforcement letters, right? Um, you can still pursue um, a cease and desist letter under a breach of contract, but there's just not the same teeth. It's harder. Um, and that's what I mentioned there. Um, oh, and licenses are poor at adapting to changes in the laws, economic conditions, right? Um, they're drafted for a very specific set of terms. Um, I'm thinking, so one of the cases that I was involved in um, one of the license provisions what involved um, location restrictions. And this was at a time like the 90s when um, uh, there, there was no real cloud-based software development, right? Everything was on a PC. You get a CD, you install it. Um, but um, changes, obviously, in technology, uh, technology evolved to allow for cloud-based software development. But the licenses were still written based on 1990s technology. Um, so there's a disconnect there, and that can lead to, to real problems. All right, so the case study I was talking about is, um, how many are familiar with, with this whole thing between Amazon and Mongo? Okay. So um, Mongo database is um, open source database. Uh, Amazon liked it. Um, they didn't directly copy the code, at least that's not what was alleged. But they went out and they studied it and they created their own version of it uh, to compete with it. Um, 
in copyright law, like that sort of thing uh, is, is not as protected, right? Because you're protecting the code itself. So if you're copying the code or you're taking the code, you're modifying it, copyright triggers, triggers in. But if you're, if you're looking at it and you're saying, well, I like what, it's, what, the, it's, what the function is, like what, what the technology is doing. I wanna recreate something that's like that using my own code. That's outside the realm of copyright, and that's kind of what happened here. Um, so one of the th things that's going on right now, um, has anybody heard the news about Terraform and Open Tofu? Okay. So right now there's a, there's a, there's a big dispute going on, kind of similar, um, but here Terraform started uh, as an open source project, a license under the Mozilla public license, and then they changed their mind. They decided for business purposes it made sense to um, switch over to a business source license. Now, when you do that, um, what I was mentioning earlier, that, that pre-existing license, it's still there. You can't go back and retroactively change it because you distributed the code to people under that open source license, so that stays. Uh, the open source community um, decided they wanted to try to fork the original open source code, so that way um, the original project would remain open uh, as an open alternative under what they branded as Open Tofu. Um, and so now, uh, I think it was just last week, uh, HashiCorp sent a cease and desist letter to the consortium Open Tofu, and they've responded. And so now you can, you can literally go online and you can see the letters they've been posted, um, the redacted, which is a very common thing. Um, but you can get a sense of how uh, these, these conflicts arise and they get fought out. Um, usually this happens all behind the scenes. You don't see any of this. Um, but in this case, they're, you know, it's open source community, so they're very open in, in sharing about it and, and you, can, you can see it on their website. All right, so the training of the models. Um, so the, the stuff in green is where the strongest copyright protection is. The stuff in yellow, it's questionable, and I think uh, patents might have a better answer. But I think this, this highlights um, why traditional copyright rules, although very important to protect uh, the open source nature of, of, of the, the AI, um, aren't gonna get you all the way. You're gonna need something more, right? Um, there's this responsible AI as an alternative license. The problem with that is it's not truly open source, right? It comes with conditions, um, with uh, 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 usage restrictions. So you, things, imagine like um, you agree not to use this code to um, harass somebody else, right? Or commit acts of genocide, which you know, I'm not making a judgment call one way or the other, if that's good or bad, but it, it takes it out of the realm of open source. And where it gets tricky from a legal perspective is when you start tying these, these conditions to a copyright, then a court might look at that and say, well, if you, if you break that, that agreement, that part, um, it's not copyright infringement, it's just contract uh, violation, right? So um, when you use the code to um, stalk somebody, for example, yeah, it, it, it was against the, the terms of use, but, um, it's not infringement. So you don't get access to those special awards. Um, also, a lot of the provisions, um, uh, one of the, the tricky things, so like acts of genocide, most likely gonna be committed by people who um, are less concerned about enforcement um, and are in jurisdictions who don't follow the rule of law. So that's gonna be really tricky versus if you put in a provision about can't be used in healthcare, right? Hospitals, I don't know why you'd want that, but hospitals, they have teams of lawyers, they are very concerned about enforcement issues and adherence to the rule of law. So they will pay attention to those sort of things. Um, so some of the provisions are gonna be easier to enforce than others. All right, um, I only have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna breeze through some of this. Trade secrets um, can help a little bit if you're not sharing parts of, of your system so like the training data, a lot of the training data and the, the models, the areas that aren't 
easily protectable. Um, definitely there can be a place for trade secrets, but then it's a trade-off, right? Because to keep a trade secret, you have to protect it. You can't let it out. You can't share it. If you do, you lose it. Um, so it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, trademarks. There's only two more left here. False. All right. Absolutely. So this is, I love this. So Red Hat, open source, right, um, is a multi-billion dollar company. This is in 2019 when they were public. They, they are no longer public traded. Um, but if you look at their, their assets, 176 million is in IP, right? A big chunk of that is um, in trademarks and patents, right? Why would, why would a company like Red Hat really want to invest a lot of money in trademarks? Because one of the big um, ways to generate revenues if you're an open source company is through your service, right? You're, you're, you're giving, um, you're allowing users to use your software for free. Sometimes you might charge a little bit, but where the real revenue comes in is if they need help using it, help installing it, help with patches, things like that. And to do that effectively um, and develop a reputation that's intimately tied to brand, right, and trademark. So that's why they invest so much in their trademark. Um, and then on the flip side, um, then they can, they can also make sure that if you're a third party providing support, that you're doing it to their standards, right? That, that you're not just some Joe Schmo, you actually know what you're doing. And they can do that through trademark enforcement, right? They can say, you're allowed to be a, a licensed support provider of Red Hat if you meet these conditions. Uh, the last one, patents and then uh, right up against the line. Uh, patents are antithetical to open source. All right. A lot of people said that, so afterwards, um, you can just come up and get some. <laughs> um, Red Hat has over 2,000 patents. Why would Red Hat, an OSS company, invest so much in patents if they were antithetical? But, okay, I see your point. Um, they, they play it, well, but then what you do with them is also very important. Uh, Red Hat has a very, uh, um, you can choose to either enforce them to block other people, or you can use them to protect uh, your open source technology, right? You can say um, somebody is, is trying to take this technology and spin it off in a proprietary manner and exclude others. And they can't do that because I, we've got a patent on it and we're gonna enforce it to make sure that it's kept open and that you're not using it for your private gain or profit. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. And for example, in the Mongo d database versus AWS case, um, where copyright failed, there could have been uh, patent protections that could have stopped um, or could have been used uh, in that dispute between Mongo and, and AWS. Uh, the last thing I'll say about patents is uh, how, how hard it is to get them in AI. It's a bit of a challenge. Um, you need somebody who understands, uh, especially computer software, uh, and how to patent it, because the patent office in particular, a lot of my colleagues have faced this, they're, they're very, very uh, particular about AI patents because of this case, Alice Corp, where the idea is you can't patent an abstract idea. But there is some light at the tunnel. There's been a couple key cases where courts have come out and said, well, hold on, there, there might be windows to get stuff patented in the AI realm um, that may apply to your model, that may apply to more than just the code itself. Maybe not the data, but you know, your, 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 the trained model that you've, you've created or the process that you go through, especially if it's tied to hardware, right? If, if you develop a new training method that um, reduces the, uh, the memory usage, for example, that's tied to something that's, that's physical, they're gonna like that a little bit more um, than if it's just purely software-based. Um, let's see, and so I am at noon. So those are the big things that I wanted to, to tackle today. If you have, I could have gone way further. Um, if you have questions, I'll be around afterwards or you can um, 
uh, link me in and send me a message. Um, thank you. Okay, so there, there's a lot there. So her, her question for those of you here is, uh, make sure I understand it. Um, for the output, uh, the question about, um, I think where the line is in terms of when you get the copyright in the output and, and, and when you don't, and does the fact that it, it may or may not be um, severed from the, the modeling process that was used to, to create the system that was used to, to generate it matters? Um, yes. So there's a lot of that going on. There's a New York Times case that's, that's come out um, that's really big on that. Um, so, so one of the big, I think it, a lot of this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, which is how, um, how involved is, are you as a user in, in manipulating and working with the AI to get the result you want? If you are heavy handed in that, um, then I think that you have a better claim in a copyright to it. Um, then if, like in my case, I just, I, I gave ChatGPT the narrative and said, give me something. Like I didn't specify anything and that's what it, it got. I think it'd be hard for me to claim a copyright in that. Um, um, you could, yeah. There, there, so the way that if I play devil's advocate, if I was a plaintiff's attorney, I would say that you knew what you're you're looking for. You had a base image or work in mind, and through the iterative process of, of working with the AI, you you got it to that. So it's basically the same as if, like, you took a, a picture, or uh, and you manually copied it down, right? Um, but instead of using like a brush, you're using the AI. As, the AI is your brush. Yeah. <laughs> and what would you tell companies or the court process about the use of AI code generation tools and whether that's safe on the health care of their operations? Yeah. Um, so I'm not giving legal advice, right? <laughs> um, I'm not your lawyer. What I would say is that um, I think I would go back to uh, something I mentioned earlier in the slides, that a lot of times there's, there's the rule of, of law and it, you have to know, it's good to know what it is, right? And it's good to know um, how much risk you're, you're, you're potentially getting yourself into by doing something. And that's, I think it's important to educate yourself on, you know, if I do X, Y, or Z, is that more or less likely to invite a cease and desist letter or a lawsuit, regardless of whether or not it, a, a judge two years from now, you know, sit, presiding over your case, hits the gavel down and decides one way or the other. Like there's a long road to get to that point and it can be very painful. And most, most cases don't get to that point, right? Most disputes. So I would say um, educate yourself, be aware, you know, do, do a little bit of, of, of um, uh, investigation as to how the AI came up with the code um, to understand. Um, you know, a lot of this is also complicated by the fact that, well, I guess in o OSS, you are publishing it publicly, so you're more likely to have eyes on it, right? I mean, if you think about um, the, what's, what's going on with um, open tofu right now, um, it's all OSS, right? So if you look at the cease and desist letter, they attached red lines of code because it's all out there. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's a risk calculation, right? Um, and I think the best thing to do is to, to just educate yourself so you know what the risks are. So you can make an informed decision. Yeah. Very complicated question, uh, a good one. So with registration, there come certain requirements about, if you, if you get a registered copyright, there's certain requirements about labeling it as such. Um, and then on the flip side, if you label it um, and somebody takes the code, copies it, and they take that copyright notice out, um, well, there's a, there's a couple things there. One is if, if they, they copy the code and they see the copyright notice, then there's really good evidence that they knew what they were doing and they did it intentionally, which for damages purposes, going back to that cease and desist letter, um, puts a lot more teeth on it, right? Because you can say, oh, it wasn't an accident. They did this on purpose. They knew, they're stamped right there. Um, the, the other side is that um, there are separate laws that prohibit um, taking those out. Um, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act violations that provide additional damages for that sort of thing. Um, uh, so again, that, it's just about creating teeth. And you said the other question was if you, yeah, yeah. So you have to make sure that as you're modifying the code that you're doing it consistent with the open source license. So the open source license will have specific requirements about what you need to do, what you not, what you can't do. Um, when you when you modify the code and distribute it out, um, and some of it is is attribution. Um, so, in many cases, like stripping the copyright notice out could be problematic if if it violates the open source license. So you have to just go back to the license and 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 check to see what it requires of you. One in the back, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's Alice Corp, which everybody knows about, or a lot of people know about. Enfish versus Microsoft, Federal Circuit case, and then the other one is uh, I think it's pronounced Macro versus Bandai Bamco. Yeah. Weights and parameters, um, weaker, right? Because, and I don't say weakest or not copyrightable because if there's a lot of judgment calls involved, then that could invoke some copyright protections, but it's, you're getting more into like the database area, which is as it is already really tricky and hard to get protections on because courts yeah, I mean, you can you can put a license on anything, whether or not if before a court it's going to be interpreted as a copyright work is a whole different other thing. Um, but yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs>